And this is really about how we can use rapid ILO production modeling to, to, um, to produce alloys quicker and ideally get into market quicker. So taking into consideration that upscalability. So we all know, I mean, we've, we've all used it, I'm sure. Um, lab scale rapid alloy production has proven invaluable for, for our industries over the, um, over the years. Offering sort of alloy development on the sort of pounds or euros level to, to, to hundreds um, for individual alloys means this is much, much cheaper than the hundreds of thousands of pounds it costs for commercial trials. This, you know, this gives a lot of um, uh, feedback and, uh, and a lot of important information. Whilst these small scales uh, production can really help with a, a lot of things, I and mean, typically when you're producing hundreds of thousands, uh, maybe through, through 3D ingot printing or, or something like this, this is really great for a lot of the uh, databases for phase stabilities and things like that, and, and maybe some alloys that um, rely mostly on the chemical composition for its properties. But steels are, are, as we know, very, very complicated beasts, and a lot of steel's properties come from their thermomechanical processing. And if you're producing this on the gram scale, then you can't really reproduce the uh, the um, processing that it goes through, and therefore you probably can't get the actual um, actual microstructures and properties, and therefore there's still quite a lot of risk when you're scaling up. And then the question is, is, is how, do we, can we, how can we reduce this risk? Is, is there alloys that don't need this? Is there alloys where we need to choose intermediate levels? Um, and hopefully that's what I'm going to talk to you today about. So dual phase steels, um, this is, this is the, the focus of this talk. Um, and this is one of the, the, uh, the grades that really depends on the processing. Um, I, I know we've got a mixture of students and, and, and senior academics here, so I'll try and cover the basics quickly. Um, so dual phase steels are one of the first generation advanced high strength steels. And obviously we have that classic mixture of soft ferrite matrix with your hard typically Martin site um, second phase. And because of this, you, you typically get quite good um, ex, um, strength elongation ratios. Um, one of the problems um, that we have is that manganese is a known segregant in, in these steels and, uh, and we generate these solute rich regions. Um, and we have this, uh, and because we're deforming in practice, typically from a sort of 230 millimeter cast down to a one millimeter product, we get these really long bands. And you can see that they're in, the, in this, in this uh, that we get these really classic dual phase banded microstructure. And that's just because of the heavy deformation that we put in. Um, these, these heavy manganese bands are obviously quite important. We know that local enrichment in manganese will change local, vari uh, local um, AE1 temperatures. So when we do our intercritical annealing for these dual phase steels, and we, during the heating up, these local areas of high manganese will start to transform first and therefore our austenite and therefore final martensite will exist in these um, uh, in, in these in these bands unless you're going to do some very clever thermal processing and whilst you know these steels are not going to say they are bad properties because they're far from bad properties but we know that if you have a heavily banded microstructure then we can really see a decrease in, in, in mechanical properties and with some literature suggesting up to 200 megapascals drop in UTS when you test at 45 degree off axis compared to in the rolling direction. And obviously quite a lot of talks here have looked at um, sheet metal forming um, or, or, or you know, complex, complex processing, um, hole, expa hole expansion for example. All of these are going to be very um, sensitive to a nice tropy like um, like this. So in addition to that as well, we also need to think about what else is in these steels and typically these are micro alloyed. And whilst the niobium in there is, is, is usually used for um, refining the grains during the hot rolling process, because niobium also is a known segregant, typically the niobium carbides that form will end up in the Martin City regions and therefore making the hardest, hardest 
phase harder and therefore increasing strain gradients and not really offering us um, any extra um, final properties. Ideally, we'd want those niobium carbides to sit in the ferrite and strengthen the ferrite. So if we think about what we don't want, what we don't want in terms of a rapid, a rapid alloy production route is to have a commercial production and then to get to a commercial product. And then we have a lab production and a lab product. These may or may not agree, depending on the alloy, depending on how much it relies on, um, on processing and depending on what equipment is the lab. But there, there is very little guarantee that there, that is the case. What we hope to achieve at Warwick is, is that you have the same, obviously, commercial product, commercial um, processing to commercial product. Then you have a step of, of trying to understand where that particular alloy gets its um, properties through thermal mechanical processing and how those can be tweaked um, to achieve similar in the lab. Therefore, we will make the lab benchmark product. Then we'll go through an optimization route um, to, to improve the product. And then we'll have the then we'll have oh sorry, I was supposed to say the new composition. And hopefully, in that case, we can say that all will be similar um, and gives extra confidence that whatever we produce in the lab can be upscaled to, to full scale production, de-risking it and hopefully getting new alloys on the market much, much faster, which let's face it, the steel industry should really be pushing. So to give an example of this, then sticking with the dual face deals. Um, then this is a typical mug structure that we've got of a, of a commercial dual face steel. Um, as you can see, we've got um, this is a this is a DP 800. Um, so we've got about 40 percent second face um, mixture of ferrite martensite, maybe a little bit of bainite in there. Um, grain size is about four and a half um, microns and a band spacing of five microns. And again, you can see the heavy banding in there, which comes from the initial micro segregation. So the first thing that we need to do is to understand where this segregation comes from. And to do that, we need to look at solidification. So this is um, confocal microscopy carried out on this steel. And we can see, um, we can see the dendrites forming and we can do this at a range of cooling rates, very controlled cooling rates. And we can see here that we've got the um, experimental data against um, some, some literature data there. And we've got a really good fit with literature data. So we know that the, um, the relationship there. We take that to the casting stage now. Um, so we've got a, a vacuum induction melting system um, at Warwick. And we couple that with some ComSol thermal simulations. So on the right there, we've got a uh, ComSol uh, simulation where we've got variable thickness molds. So we'll make a different mold for depending on the situation. And what we're interested in is how can we change this geometry to get the part we want? Well, looking at five different cast thicknesses here for, for on a lab scale, and that this gives us five different cooling rates. If we highlight particularly the cooling rate um, during the mushy zone, so when the dendrites are formed, we can see um, in, the, in, the, in the five situations here. We use the dendrite arm spacing equation that we found from the confocal microscope, which means that we can have a rough idea about the, the, uh, the scale of the segregation in, in the five different casts. And we know that we want to roll down to a one millimeter product finally. So the 50 mil will be rolled down 50 times and the 10 mil will only be rolled 10 times. And then this will give us band, final band spacings like this. And for this particular example, we can see that the 30 millimeter mold will give us the band spacing that we're after towards the end. So then we go through the production process. So that gets cast. And then depending on what we're doing it with, it, with it, we may put it through the um, um, large scale hot rolling, which lets us produce decent lengths of material, or we'll use the Gleeble HDS where um, we want to have a slightly more controlled um, rolling process um, and, and cooling. Um, once, once it's been uh, hot and cold rolled, we will then do intercritical annealing, which is typical for these uh, 
these DP steels. This is quite a quick annealing line rather than batch. So we've got about a uh, 100, 120 second hold at temperature before it's quenched. Um, and obviously we follow that up with tensile testing. I've taken off the uh, I've taken off the um, values of here because it's a commercial grade. But as you can see, we've got really good agreement between the stress strain curve from a full scale production and the WMG wrap produced. And I must say here that for this particular example, we used subsize samples. So actually, rather than total elongation, um, uniform elongation is a is a much more appropriate um, measure. So again, we're, we're really quite happy with this agreement. And we're looking at about a week for. for for this level of scrutiny um, and design and, and hopefully confidence in, in, in the next scale. And depending on which alloys we're working on, we may need to do a, a deeper dive, but, but typically I'd say around a week for this. Um, so what? I mean, we've produced 10 kilos of an alloy that um, the big steel producers produce on megatons a year. So we need to do something more with that. So uh, what can we do with this information? Well, if we think about what we want from a dual face steel, we want to produce um, an alloy that has this great distribution of martensite. Um, so we really want to uh, encourage austenite formation, not in those solute rich regions, but to form um, obviously in, the, in, the, in an originally random perlite, uh, distributed perlite structure, and then any extra volume fraction to come at triple points and then to have that low connectivity, have a high mean free path um, and, and, and get good strength to elongation ratios. What we need to bear in mind is that obviously a, a lot of the, um, uh, some of the alloy content in there is for solid solution strengthening. So we need to make sure that any changes that we make, we keep that as a, as a balance. And in an ideal world, any changes that we, we make actually don't include any big changes to the processing because any increase in processing or any additional steps increases price. So um, I've used um, Micress um, in combination with uh, TCFE 10 Thermocal database and using a combination of Comsol and, and, and this Micress, we can have a look at what the solidification of the conventional um, the benchmark alloy, alloy looks like. And you can see that we have solidification there, we have um, delta forming, and then we've got austenite forming. And then we have on the right, we have the uh, um, our resultant manganese map. We then do a deep dive. So each pixel of that we've used to create a histogram. Um, and as you can see, manganese really heavily um, can heavily segregate. We're getting sort of the classic sort of 30, 40 percent peak values to our, our mean uh, values. Um, silicon to a much lower level and, and chrome very, very low indeed. Um, but what um, uh, what we can use with this information is that if we assume that the first regions to that will um, turn into austenite during intercritical annealing are going to be these high austenite areas and then these uh, these high manganese areas and uh, these are going to be the the last to form then actually local a1 temperatures can vary by 70 degrees so there's no uh, you know no question that we are going to definitely get very high localized um, austenite formation in these banded regions 70 degrees is is, is just too high we can improve that. So on, on this graph on the right, I've shown the the range of A1 temperatures um, based on the segregation profile of different manganese content. And of course, if you lower the manganese content, your your, your segregation levels reduce and, and therefore you get better agreement. But because we get this, then we're A, compromising solid solution strengthening, um, and B, we're not actually vastly improving it, we're still seeing um, a difference all the way down. So what we want is something that co-segregates with it, that um, offers solid solution strengthening, but also um, is a ferrite stabilizer. So we went through the iterations, we went through the thought process and silicon for us was the best candidate. So if we could just start mapping this out, 
Um, so in terms of solid solution strengthening contribution, um, we plotted, uh, plotted the manganese content against silicon content here, and you can see the total contribution in megapascals there on the right. And then if we do those, those micro simulations um, over and over, we can also get this map in terms of local differences in, in A1 temperatures using different manganese and silicon contents. And then if we can combine those two graphs and we choose a solid solution strengthening that's within 10% of the original benchmark, and we want an AE1 temperature range that's less than five degrees, then we create this kind of sweet spot of um, alloy compositions here. So we kind of want to pick some something probably around here. It, um, we dropped the manganese content, so it was originally up at 1.8, so it's now 0.25, and we've had to increase the uh, the silicon content to um, to accommodate that. And we've now got these new histograms. You can now see that whilst we still have a uh, about a 30 percent segregation profile within the manganese, the obviously the absolute values are much lower. And then if we look at the um, the austenite formation. Um, stability and um, the properties and um, diagram here then in the solute rich regions obviously we form here and, and the solute poor so they form quite separate whereas in the modified alloy we're getting almost perfect overlapping now so everywhere within the sample we should be having the same driving force for um, formation of the austenite during the intercritical annealing which should really promote the um, uh, this to be distributed much better. Um, I must say at this point that yes, we've dropped the manganese, increased the silicon. So the only thing that we've had to change for for the intercritical annealing is the temperature at which we hold it at. So it, rather than the 750, we're now just heating it up to we're heating it up to 820, still holding it for exactly the same time. Okay, so if we look at some micrographs. So first we're looking at the hot rolled microstructures. Uh, so hot rolled coiled. Um, this is the original benchmark, again, very heavily uh, banded. And then we look at the modified alloy, completely disrupted that banding. So uh, the grain size is comparable, which is, which is nice, but our, our positioning of our perlite is, is, is very, very much reduced. So even after cold rolling, we're expecting that, that perlite to have not elongated too much. And we've, we've got a really great starting position here for, for property uniformity. Cold rolled, so these were cold rolled and 75% uh, and intercritically annealed. Then this is our benchmark. Again, same story, but um, got a, uh, oh sorry, that should be 270, that should be 270, I think. Um, and then going to uh, the modified alloy, um, and we've again completely even after deforming the perlite then we've still maintained this this excellent uh, uh, distribution in second phase and the hardness the values here show that we actually have pretty much entirely um, covered the solid solution solid solution strengthening parts of 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 this so from that aspect as well um, we've had quite good success and if we just uh, um, so just to just to conclude my part, because I think my time's coming up. Um, so we've used lab based rapid alloy production here to really sort of show consideration of both the composition, but also we're really interested in in rapid prototyping the, the production side and the processing side as well. And um, we benchmark this against the DP800 and we still really good agreement from obviously lab production to, to, to commercial. Um, and then we've we've suggested a new alloy here to try and disrupt this banding that will cause um, anisotropic um, properties. Um, we did this through a, a combination of phase field modeling, then property mapping, highlighting specific uh, um, a, a target area to, to really reduce those local variations in AE1, um, but also maintain the solid solution strengthening. Um, and we've seemingly removed it from and um, removed banding from both the hot rolled and cold rolled um, microstructures. Um, 
I would love to be able to show you mechanical properties today, but this is ongoing work and, and we'll be publishing a paper on this shortly. Um, I've also, I believe, my PhD students in the crowd listening. So um, I, I think that'll be something that he's working on in the very near future. So I hope to present to you the mechanical properties on this, um, both tensile, hollow expansion, et cetera. So I guess keep an ear out. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, happy to answer them. <laughs>